Okay, welcome everybody uh, to the Assault on Pensions and How to Fight Back uh, Labor Notes Workshop. I'm Barbara Mataloni and I'm on staff at Labor Notes. For those of you who are new to Labor Notes, we are a more than four decade project and uh, we have a magazine and publications and we do workshops like these and consultations. Uh, and our project is, is to support rank and file union members to build more democratic, transparent fighting unions. Uh, and we do that because we are, uh, we believe that when we do that, when unions are democratic, when workers have more power, uh, we'll be able to build a more just world. And this is just one example of how we can do that. Uh, by taking on uh, Wall Street, as Matthew is going to tell us about. Uh, so just a few things. Um, please keep yourselves muted uh, until you're asked to speak. Uh, if you want to speak, go ahead and use the uh, reaction button to raise your hand. We can see you there. You can also write stack and chat, but we'll see you more easily if you raise your hand and uh, we'll call on you. This is really going to be a presentation and a conversation. So do ask questions, do raise your hand, make sure that you're like understanding what's happening. Don't let Matthew slip something by that you're confused about. Uh, make sure you say, wait a second, I didn't understand that. Uh, uh, this is, we have to make sure that we're all like knowing where we're going and leaving on the same page here. So uh, please, please do that. And again, keep yourselves muted uh, when you're not speaking. Uh, really excited to introduce and grateful to Matthew for offering to do this. Uh, our first workshop that I know of uh, online on pensions. Um, and uh, Matthew, as you uh, may know, uh, is a reporter with The Lever. Uh, he also is the former uh, public pensions specialist for Communication Workers of America uh, and a friend of Labor Notes, a former intern of Labor Notes. Uh, so uh, Matthew is um, going to take it from here. Uh, and again, uh, you all should uh, also just introduce yourselves in the chat now that most of you are here, uh, where you are, who you are, uh, what, what local you're from. So Matthew, I'm going to hand it off to you. Thanks. Uh, great. Yeah, thank you, Barbara. Um, yeah, you know, i a uh, huge fan of Labor Notes um, and uh, I, you know, the genesis of this is, is of my interest in pensions is a labor notes connection as well, where um, when I was an intern at labor notes back in 2012, uh, I uh, got turned on to what was happening uh, with the CTU. Um, so this was before the CTU strike. Um, and then I covered the CTU strike for the nation. Uh, later that year, uh, and and as the strike was winding down, I was talking to different people um, at the CTU about okay, so what's what's the next fight on your agenda? And so the two things that came up the most were school closings, which we know a lot about, but then uh, this pension fight. And I was like, you know, I was 24 years old, and I was like, well, I I know nothing about that, <laughs> and so I'm I'm interested in in knowing more, and so then that began, you know, an 11 year now obsession uh, of mine, which is, you know, basically there's this uh, over five trillion dollar pool of capital um, that is workers' money, uh, but is used in uh, really destructive uh, ways for the most part, and so why is that the case, and and how can we we use uh, our knowledge of of this issue to kind of um, to help to challenge uh, <laughs> the total uh, aristocracy of the bosses that we currently live under? Um, uh, one housekeeping item: I, I really love uh, interruptions. So again, this is a this is a complicated topic. You know, you know, the interest from this got me really excited, and I was talking to Barbara earlier being like, oh, you know, well, I, you know, I'd love to do a healthcare one uh, now, which I, you know, is another issue that I've spent a lot of time kind of studying and how unions can bargain healthcare. And it made me reflect about just how this is a substantially more esoteric and complex issue, even than healthcare, which is a very complicated uh, issue. Um, so 
love interruptions, please uh, interject. Um, and, and Barbara's watching the chat. And um, so, yeah. Uh, and this cartoon is is something we commissioned at CWA when I was there, which I, you know, I really think kind of helps to uh, underscore some of this whole uh, issue here, which is, you know, there's, uh, you know, Andrew Cuomo said when he was attorney general, you know, if he if you follow the money in New York State, uh, the largest pool of money is is the pension fund, um, and I, I think that that's really true here, which where it is there's, you know this is an extraordinarily tempting pool of money for politicians to exploit, uh, and in particular politicians who don't have our best interests uh, at heart. So yeah, wanted to kind of start, you know, especially because we're, you know, recording, you know, start out with some kind of vocabulary, you know, some of you, I, I know many of you on this workshop, uh, and so some of you have actually taken this workshop before, in which case, welcome back. Um, but um, yeah, I wanted to just kind of start out with this because I mean, basically, and I, I probably should have done a, a slide on this, but basically, you know, there's two kind of big components of pensions. There's the benefits side and there's the investments uh, side. Uh, and what I'm trying to do here is kind of cross that bridge here, because typically in labor, we really only talk about the benefits side. And I, I think it's really important that we, and, and so you could say that's the total ulterior motive of, or, you know, uh, of this workshop is to try and kind of draw that connection um, uh, for you all. So, yeah, you know, so there's a the defined benefit plans, which is, you know, the gold standard, which we are, you know, seeking to maintain in the public sector uh, and in the few places in the private sector that we still have them seeking to maintain. Uh, and it's a pension plan. Uh, with a guaranteed benefit for one's retirement. So you bargain with the employer over what the, not the contributions, but what the benefit will be. And so once an employer agrees to, what, or employers in the case of a multi-employer plan agrees to what a benefit is going to be, that's not changeable. Uh, and the employer or employers will make contributions to the plan to meet the benefits that have been negotiated with the union. In contradistinction to that, you have a defined contribution plan. Uh, so there, you know, if you're a union, you're only bargaining what the employers are paying in. Uh, and so uh, DC plans tend to have significantly higher fees than defined benefit plans. Uh, there tends to be poor practices across the board. And then in particular, you know, you're really exposed to the vagaries of the market. So, you know, if you retire in 2009 or, you know, March 2020 or different times when the market is cratered, um, you see huge losses to the amount um, uh, that was in your, um, in, in, in your plan. Uh, whereas that's not true with a defined benefit plan. A defined benefit plan means that when you retire, you know what you're going to get. Um, so, it, you know, when, when we talk about kind of this move to a 401k style plan, you know, what we're talking about is, is exposing unionized workers and workers, period, to the exigencies of the market, which really is counter, in my view, to everything about uh, trade unionism. And so it's why it's a perfect opportunity, I think, for Labor Notes uh, to help um, to convene this discussion <laughs> because, you know, Labor Notes is about what trade unionism is supposed to be about. Um, and so, yeah, you know, and then kind of, so yeah, these, I mean, there's many more terms, but I think it's, you know, these are words that are thrown out. So an actuary um, is, as it relates to pensions is the person who makes estimates based on mortality uh, statistics, typically uh, that form the basis for how much uh, should be put into the defined benefit pension plan. Um, and then the actuarially required contribution is the annual contribution to a public plan uh, in this or a plan period um, made from, uh, from employer and employee contributions. So yeah, in the aftermath of the financial crisis, um, 
we really saw uh, massive attacks on defined benefit plans. Um, so almost every state passed uh, legislation that reduced, uh, you know, included higher employee contributions, higher retirement ages, new pension tiers for new employees, and the beginning of efforts to shift public employees into 401ks uh, or DC plans. And for the most part, I mean, to be clear, you know, those efforts to shift employees into exclusively 401ks haven't been successful for the most part. There's been a few places where it has been, Jacksonville, Florida being one of the key examples there. Um, but as the pension benefits become more stingy as these uh, nationwide attacks uh, engendered, uh, you see this a greater pressure uh, that's understandable on individual employees, uh, individual union members to make larger contributions to their 403B or 401k plans to make up for the decline in benefits in their DP plans. So it's it's really, really, even if you don't see for the most part, kind of the elimination of DP plans altogether, you do see uh, this greater exposure of workers to the exigencies of the market. And that's bad. So just um, Linda is just wanting clarification around that the DB plans don't change, but the DCs can change. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you know, if an employer over the course of your career makes, you know, let's say $700,000 in cash contributions, you know, to your DC plan um, and $700,000 in contributions to your DP, DB plan, you know, your DB plan is not going to change because your employer is required to make up the difference. But if they make that contribution to your DC plan and the market crashes or you're exposed to fees that are too high, uh, you know, you're on your own, you know, or, you know, in some cases too, you know, you, you have a family emergency. I mean, your kid needs to go to rehab, you know, and there's only one good rehab and it costs 200 grand. And then you spend, you know, a third of your entire nest egg in one go, um, you know, that is is another common problem with 401k style plans. Whereas, you know, with a, a traditional defined benefit plan, you know, you get your $2,000 a month um, and it's just like social security. And no matter what happens uh, in your life, you're going to get that $2,000 a month. Um, so yeah, you know, I mean, you can see, I mean, again, it's so similar to the different fights that you face for anything, you know, on the job is <laughs> like the boss wants you, wants to privatize the risk <laughs> of your employment and what, whether it's healthcare, you know, whether it's wages, you know, or whether it's pensions, they want you to bear the risk, not them. Uh, and so this is exactly the same dynamic here. And so it really jives with everything that we've seen coming from the right and the Koch brothers and you know, libertarianism writ large, which is that, you know, individual, you know, there's that Margaret Thatcher quote, right, that sums it up, you know, there is no such thing as society, only individual men and women. Uh, and that's exactly kind of what is the underlying logic here behind the DC 401k style plan. And, and Liz is wondering if you could say a little more about that sentence about uh, mass media hysteria over scale of long term liabilities like what are some of the long-term yeah. liabilities that they use as to get us afraid about yeah so we're going to we're about to go into that but yeah you know i mean basically yeah that let, let's just go to the next slide um uh, um well yeah so first of all sorry i i uh, don't worry i'm going to get to that in the slide after this i i first want to kind of describe kind of so you know john arnold i mean when i started doing this work, John Arnold was very front and center. And now he's really kind of taken a step back. Um, but he is, it's only, you know, stepping back from the public eye. His foundation is still, and he personally are the number one funders of the people who are quoted almost exclusively about public pension benefits, which is the Pew Retirement Centers uh, and the Brookings Institution, as well as the Urban Institute. Those are the three main think tanks. They're very highly respected, nonpartisan think tanks. Um, but what they do is they say, well, you know, 
if you're an ordinary state legislator or a member of the public or even a public employee yourself, the only thing that you need to worry about are, are the funded status of your plan. That's the only thing that matters. Uh, and plans are getting worse and worse funded. And so it's a crisis. And the only thing, the only way to address the crisis is to cut benefits or to reduce the size of the plan in one way or another, you know, putting, you know, multiple tiers, you know, I mean, right now, you know, we're fighting tiers at, you know, the big three and at UPS, you know, I mean, pension funds uh, have more tiers than any other area of unionized uh, life where you'll see six, seven, eight tiers uh, of plans, depending on how long uh, you've been working uh, in a pension plan. And so that's about, right, just like you see tiers in the private sector about undermining solidarity, that's exactly what they do in the public sector as well. Is they, you know, the newer workers don't care about their pension because it's half or less as generous as the pension uh, of a more senior employee. And so then you're a millennial like me and you're like, I've been a teacher for, you know, 13 years. <laughs> um, you know, why is my pen now I've been around long enough to figure out that my pension is way less generous uh, than the people who are retiring currently. What's that about? Well, you know, this just means that I just need to focus on, you know, side hustles or whatever, you know, and put as much money in my 403B as possible uh, and, you know, screw these older teachers who who saw this happening when I was 22 and, and didn't do anything. Um, and so that's, you know, that's really, again, is kind of the underlying source of this attack here, which is it's so much more sophisticated, in my view, uh, what John Arnold has been able to do than what the Koch brothers have been able to do, which is, you know, he kind of correctly, he read this book um, written by some right wing nut job about, you know, how public sector unions are taking over America. And he's like, well, you know, I'm a sophisticated guy. How can I undercut the political power and influence of public sector unions? Uh, and I think he was correct to say, well, you know, going after these pensions is the most effective way because it's about dividing the workforce and it's about increasing turnover. So when we're in a situation where, you know, and the better unions, you know, have recovered pretty well from Janus, but, you know, when you have a higher level of turnover, uh, which is caused by having less generous pension benefits, you know, and people just leaving, then you're, it's so much more difficult to build a strong union culture. Um, and so, yeah, this, he read a book, you know, and then he spent tens of millions of dollars um, funding this attack on pensions. And it's, it's still ongoing today. I mean, when you read, you know, about pension fund statuses, you can trace this all to John Arnold, where he, he has crafted a highly effective narrative that the only thing that matters is funded status. And of course, funded status matters. Uh, but the way that it's addressed is twofold, you know, and we'll get into this more, but it's, you know, I mean, it's higher taxes on the rich. Uh, <laughs> that's an essential component. But also, you know, ensuring that the pension funds are well managed, um, because as we're about to get into, you know, for the most part, they aren't well managed. So, yeah, we, we kind of went over this a little bit, but yeah, I mean, just to, you know, uh, reiterate, you know, this DC plans are about privatizing the risk to workers at the expense of having a robust defined benefit pension plan. And it, you know, when you, when you move to a DC plan, it's an even more extreme version of having these multiple tiers in public plans, higher turnover, undermining steward structures and union stability, especially in a post Janus environment. So unfunded liabilities. So, you know, uh, again, as I said, funded status is important, um, but look, the, the, these are obligations that can be paid off over 30 or 40 years. So when it's, you hear these, you know, these huge numbers, like, 
you know, Illinois has, you know, I, I don't have the number in front of me, but, you know, $44 billion in pension debt, you know, and it's a crisis, you know, and so, and this cartoon, you know, is a perfect example here. It's like, it's the Hindenburg f flying into <laughs> the Eiffel Tower, you know, uh, like there is no way to address the pension issue except to cut benefits. But there's only been one public pension fund that's ever run out of money. <laughs> it's a tiny town of Pritchard, Alabama. There was, you know, widespread theft. Um, and, you know, the, the model of, of a funded status for pension funds comes from the private sector. Uh, and so in the private sector, companies go bankrupt all the time, uh, you know, and but that is incredibly rare. Uh, in the public sector. And even when they do go bankrupt in the public sector, they come out, you know, okay, more or less. I mean, bankruptcy is a whole other bag of cats. I mean, every municipal bankruptcy, in my view, was, you know, about generating fees for law firms and not about actually helping cities become more financially stable. But yeah, companies don't have a tax base. Um, even the poorest cities and towns in America will have a tax base in perpetuity. People aren't going to leave. Um, and uh, but what these huge numbers are are done, uh, the way these huge numbers are used, is are as cudgels uh, to advocate cuts uh, to our pensions. Um, so in every place, in every battle that I've been a part of to protect pensions. The biggest issue that we deal with uh, in state legislatures uh, are these huge numbers. Uh, and it's like, you know, a state senator will say, you know, what are we going to do about this crisis of, you know, billions of dollars in unfunded obligations? Uh, and it's a perfect way of, of redirecting the conversation away from the crisis of poverty in our schools, the crisis of racial injustice, the crisis of the school to prison pipeline, the crisis of environmental degradation. It's like, no, instead these huge numbers that are really artificial that don't present a, an accurate portrayal of the health of the pension system because it's not accounting for the health of the entire state or, or municipality that funds the pension system. Uh, no, we need to focus on these big numbers. And it's, I, I mean, to be honest, it's, I mean, it's, it's highly effective, uh, in convincing everybody, including union members that, uh, you need to accept these pension changes. And I, you know, I think you even see, you know, very well-meaning people, um, uh, well-meaning labor leaders, buying into this hypothesis of, well, you know, we have to do something about the pension. People who I deeply respect uh, saying, well, we have to do something about the pension. And it's like, not really. <laughs> I mean, we have to do something about the fact that the benefits aren't generous enough. That's what we need to do about it. Uh, because, you know, when we have vacant positions in a school district, that hurts children. When we have vacant positions in the public sector, that hurts public services. And that is a real immediate crisis when there aren't enough teachers <laughs> that, uh, or, to, or, para, or paraprofessionals or bus drivers. That is a real crisis because real people are being hurt in real time by the failure of the public sector to offer a benefits package that is able to recruit and retain the most qualified staff possible. Uh, and so unfortunately, though, you'll frequently see labor leaders being like, well, we need to, we need to negotiate with them about this, about the, these numbers that don't bear any real uh, uh, coordination with reality in the way that uh, failing public services in the way that failing to retain qualified uh, public employees has a real concrete effect on how people are living their lives and how people are responding to institutions right now, today.
so yeah, this is one. There's there's a few <laughs> uh, slides here that are a little bit on the more difficult side, and so <laughs> I, I I and for some reason I'm, my slide is a little cut off, and I so I'll share the the slides with you um, afterwards. But um, so actuaries calculate the value of unfunded pension liabilities by using what's called an assumed actuarial rate of return, or the what also called the discount rate. Uh, and so Arnold, Pugh, Brookings, Urban, they've been pushing for pension funds to reduce their discount rates. And what a reduced discount rate does is it inflates the long-term value of unfunded liabilities. Uh, in turn forcing higher contributions uh, from states and municipalities. So it's really effective double movement. So there's more money in the pension for, and we're gonna get to this in later slides, you know, for Wall Street to extract. Uh, and then the higher costs uh, create the basis for more attacks on pensions. So in every place where you see kind of organized systematic attacks on pensions, the most effective ones, you'll see substantial reductions in the discount rate. So Detroit was a perfect example of this. They reduced the discount rate to one of the lowest in the country. And then they said, oh my gosh, this city has so much unfunded debt. We need to go into bankruptcy and <laughs> cut the pensions <laughs> uh, to, to, to address this debt crisis that we created by changing the accounting method by which pension obligations are calculated. So, I mean, to be clear, you don't wanna go too high with the discount rate. You wanna make it so the discount rate roughly reflects the performance of, you know, a stock bond index fund, uh, over you know 20 or 30 years. And so for me, that's you know somewhere between seven and seven and a half percent. Um, but instead, you'll really see uh people pushing substantially lower discount rates, six percent, even lower than six percent. The right wingers are pushing zero percent uh discount rates, or you know, somewhere between zero and one percent discount rates. And let's be clear about where this is coming from. They want these huge numbers that they can throw around uh, so that they can, in turn, cut the benefits and, in turn, crush unions. So it's, you know, it's complicated. You know, it's, it's not the easiest thing to understand. And that's by design, uh, in my view. Like, they want this to be as inscrutable as possible for ordinary people with as large as numbers as possible so that they can achieve their overarching goal, which is crushing the labor movement and crushing public sector labor unions. So yeah, just to reiterate, again, this is a complicated slide, I apologize, but it's, you know, so they use the discount rate to calculate the long-term obligations of the plan, the long-term liabilities of the plan, the lower that discount rate is, the higher the long-term obligations are. Uh, and when those obligations are higher, that's when you get those huge numbers about unfunded liabilities that then is in turn used to advocate cuts to our benefits. And, you know, I mean, let's be clear. It's, oh, go ahead, Barbara. Yeah, yeah I was just gonna say, just to be clear, like that the, so what the discount rate is saying is it's a it's how much you're going to be able to the uh, investments are going to earn over time, yes. And so they're saying ah they're not going to earn that much over time. So yes. therefore you need to put more in in yes. order to meet your obligations. That's yes. That's what that means. All right. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. And so um, yeah. So the lower um, yeah. I I think the other thing that's really important here is. Uh, is it's not just, frankly, a tax on benefits per se, because sometimes, and these days it's a little bit, you know, you'll see more of this where it's, they'll be like, oh, well, you know, we're not going after your pension, but, you know, you know, try getting new schools in this environment, try getting, you know, 
uh, higher pay or better health care in this environment. We have to make this huge you know, contribution to your pension. So that means you're not going to be getting anything else that you're asking for, whether it's smaller class sizes, whether it's green schools, whether it's expanded social workers or psychologists or counselors or PE or, uh, uh, or foreign languages or whatever, you're not going to get that because, hey, we're making this huge contribution to the pension on your behalf. And I think the one thing that is a little bit fair, I think, is, I mean, you know, there's sometimes when, you know, politicians, you know, don't believe kind of the Kool-Aid, you know, like, it's impossible to think that, you know, the Congressional Progressive Caucus, for example, thought that they were doing rail workers a favor when they voted to crush the rail strike. I, I, I can't believe that. Uh, <laughs> but in this case, I mean, they really do believe this, you know, and so it's about, explaining to them first that they're wrong, but they do believe that these discount rates are too high and that they do believe that to save the pension, you know, that they have to destroy the pension to save it. I, I think that's because because these people have so, these people being, you know, act, you know anti-union actuaries and, and kind of these nonpartisan think tanks have so colonized the public debate around pensions. Um, I, I think, when you encounter a governor or a finance secretary or whomever you know who's spouting this, I I, I don't doubt their uh, whether or not they're genuine uh, in believing this. Uh, but I think it's very clear to kind of I mean ultimately intentions don't really matter. You know the practical effect of this is to is to advance cuts to benefits to advance cuts to. Um, uh, the types of essential service, social services that we all know we need um, at the expense of this uh, highly technical idea of how uh, pensions should be funded or maintained uh, that has the practical effect of massively increasing the pot of money uh, for Wall Street to um, exploit. So that's what we're going to get into. Um, so yeah, you know, while the media, while Brookings, Urban, you know, uh, crow about unfunded liabilities, these huge numbers, Wall Street walks to the bank. And this is the story that's basically never told. So you never hear in the media that public pensions pay out $10 billion or more, sub potentially substantially more to Wall Street annually in fees. Uh, and annually, um, uh, the cost of underperformance is about $70 billion a year. Um, so these are huge amounts of money that's flying out the door. Uh, and that is basically what underperformance is, is if you compare the way that the pension fund is invested currently against a stock and bond index fund with a similar amount of risk, uh, what's the difference? Uh, and so that's where that number comes from. So instead of, and we're about to get into this more, instead of just going the lowest risk, the most sensible option possible, which is an index fund, um, instead they're investing it huge amounts of money, tens of billions of dollars, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars of public pension capital into some of the most dangerous, riskiest, highest fee, expensive, uh, heinous uh, entities on the planet. And that's what the rest of this workshop is going to touch on, which is private equity, private equity, real estate, and hedge funds. And I, I you know, I get, just to preface this, I don't think, I mean, from a labor movement perspective, I don't think there's a level of disdain that we should hold these people to, the hedge fund and private equity managers. Uh, these are the absolute worst individuals on the planet. Uh, I mean, these are truly offensive individuals. Um, you know, just to kind of provide some initial context, um, I was friends with somebody who was a private chef uh, for one of these guys. And her description of the lifestyles that these private equity and hedge fund managers lead, I was astounded by. I mean, they 
don't in, the families all live in these huge compounds, you know, tens of millions of dollars. And the kids will just go out in the morning, spend tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars on designer clothes, come back in the evening and never wear them. And that's just what they do day after day after day after day. And what we're going to go into is that tragically, those lifestyles are financed by our public pension funds. So the growth of hedge fund and private equity, which is now, uh, I, I'm sorry, I should have had the exact number. Right now, it's about a quarter. Uh, so uh, about one and a half trillion dollars of the five and a half trillion dollars in total public pension fund assets is invested in hedge funds and private equity and private equity real estate. Uh, and this is a massive, massive increase uh, just in the past 20 years, just in the past decade. In the past decade, it's gone up by about 40%. 20 years ago, maybe one-tenth of the amount that is currently invested, about 150 billion you had uh, in private equity and hedge funds and private real estate. And this is universal. Uh, I mean, the only exception, there are some county public pension funds in Pennsylvania that have avoided this trend. Uh, the Nevada uh, State Employees Retirement System has uh, not avoided it entirely by any means, but has limited their participation. Um, but basically, universally, uh, public pension funds, blue states, red states, wherever, have massively increased their allocations to hedge fund and private equity. Um, and, and with private equity real estate being a subset of private equity. Um, so yeah, the, in 2022, uh, the top 25 hedge fund managers made an average of uh, $570 million each. Um, so that's, I mean, that's just, yeah. I mean, so compare, you know, Walmart, where we kind of is the poster child for corporate inequality, uh, he made $24 million. So the average, it's it's a over, you know, two and a half thousand percent higher uh, the compensation of these guys than even some of the highest compensated CEOs uh, in the country. Um, even Amazon, uh, you know, I, I think the average for the last two years for Amazon CEO Andy Jassy is a hundred million a year. So um, uh, these these guys make over uh, uh, six times uh, what, or over five times what, uh, Amazon CEO makes. So this is this is extreme levels of inequality um, that are being uh, engendered by our public pension funds. And this, you know, Blackstone to me is kind of the perfect, you know, example here. You know, I, I will just kind of touch a little bit more. I, I guess I this is giving me a good idea for a few more slides, which is, you know, these these investments are not like ordinary stock and bond investments. So the they're not regulated. Uh, they're barely regulated. So stocks and bonds, you know, and, and uh, you know, companies that have stock or bonds have to provide all this public information uh, about what they are doing with uh, the money that uh, investors have, uh, whether owning their bonds or owning their stock. That none of that applies to hedge funds uh, or private equity, uh, hedge fund or private equity funds. Um, there's, it's opaque, it's a black box. Uh, uh, the only thing we know about the way that this uh, trillion and a half dollars, uh, $1.5 trillion is being invested is what the managers say themselves. Uh, they're not audited uh, uh, by a third party. Um, uh, the contracts are not public. If you file a public records request for these contracts, uh, they'll assert trade secrets. Uh, they're the only public contracts that are not uh, accessible to the public. Uh, you can't access uh, their meeting minutes of the uh, advisory committees that have uh, public officials on them. Uh, they um, 
Uh, and then they get this tax treatment that allows these people that, that you many of you are probably familiar with, but then the carried interest tax deduction, which allows them to treat their income as capital gains income. So this $570 million each is taxed at the lower capital gains rate of 15% uh, instead of the top marginal tax rate of, of 39%. Um, so yeah, that's just, I mean, and that is really the tip of the iceberg for, in my view, how criminal uh, this industry is. And it's a criminal industry that is entirely dependent on our public pension funds. And so Blackstone is just kind of the perfect example here. So uh, it was uh, co-founded by Stephen Schwartzman and Pete Peterson, who passed away, the latter of whom passed away uh, a few years ago. Pete Peterson was Nixon's Secretary of Commerce. Um, and uh, this, this entire company, I mean, these days, Stephen Schwartzman is something like the seventh wealthiest individual in the country. He's worth well over $20 billion. Um, uh, and his entire business operation is dependent on public pensions, uh, manages tens of billions of dollars in public pension uh, funds uh, while delivering returns that uh, appear to not be as well as the market. So, I mean, there's that's another kind of core issue here, going back to this black box, is we don't know how well uh, these investments actually perform. Uh, which seems insane, right? You know, these are supposed to be sophisticated public pension fund investors with tens of billions of dollars at their disposal, uh, highly compensated staff with, you know, significant financial experience. No, we, we, if you went up to the CEO of CalPERS or the CEO of the Mass Prem or the CEO of the Chicago Teachers Pension Fund, and you asked them, how do you know as in, have you independently verified the performance of your private equity funds? They would immediately say, well, we haven't independently verified their performance. We trust the managers. And there's a lot of really important reasons why you shouldn't trust the managers, because when they sell off the private equity funds before they mature, they endure massive write downs. So CalPERS recently was valuing, you know, I, I, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but they, let's say they were valuing this private equity fund investment at $10 and then they sold it for $4, uh, for $6. Um, so th there is absolutely no reason to trust <laughs> what the pension funds are saying about how well these pension funds have been performing, how, how well these private equity funds have been performing and certainly no reason to trust the managers themselves. So Schwartzman goes and takes all of his enormous uh, profits that he's gotten from public pension funds and becomes one of the largest Republican donors in the country. So every year he contributes somewhere between 15 and $20 million to right-wing Republican politicians who are pretty explicitly anti-pension and very explicitly anti-union. Um, and so this is, you know, I mean, <laughs> this is using workers' own money to finance a massive coordinated and systematic assault on workers. Uh, so if you're familiar with, you know, Karl Marx on alienated labor, <laughs> uh, I can say this in a labor notes crowd, <laughs> you know, Marx wrote about like, you know, the product of the worker is then used to enslave the worker. <laughs> This is exactly what you're talking about, except it's financialized, uh, where the products of the workers are used to uh, create a massive, uh, organized, systematic assault on workers. And Peterson, uh, uh, the other co-founder, was by far the, the most effective uh, advocate for cutting Social Security, Medicare, and veterans benefits uh, over the past few decades. So he spent his Blackstone fortune financing an extraordinary array of groups who were saying the only way to, that the number one, I mean, very similar, except writ large, 
uh, you know, which is, you know, the national debt is a crisis. Uh, and the only way to address the national debt uh, is to cut Social Security and Medicare benefits and veterans benefits. And so we're seeing, you know, and he he endowed many of these organizations after their death, uh, after his death. And we're seeing this come uh, up in a, in a big way now where um, uh, Kevin McCarthy, the House Speaker, has uh, talked about a new commission to cut Social Security and Medicare benefits. Um, it really seems like this is, is on the table again in a big way. And that is because more than anybody else, that is because of the actions of Pete Peterson. So again, you know, Blackstone gets tens of billions of dollars from pension funds of unionized workers, public pension trustees who are union members, uh, many of them active in their union voting to approve investments in Blackstone that we don't know how well they perform. We only know that the fees are extraordinarily large uh, and that the transparency is poor. Uh, and then when the campaign finance records come out, we know that uh, that at least a portion of that money is going to finance um, uh, extreme right-wing uh, efforts. Um, so yeah, you know, I mean, there's, I can go on all day about this, as you can probably guess, but um, uh, Schwartzman was one of the few business executives to stand with Trump uh, after January 6th uh, and to support his election denial efforts. Uh, and then there was a very interesting case in 2018 where um, a rent control ballot initiative in California, uh, their largest donors were private equity funds that had large public pension fund investments in it. So the, the money that was literally supposed to be profits allocated back to the pension funds themselves were using to crush a rent control ballot initiative um, in California in 2018. So when you have these poor investment returns and these high fees, um, it reduces the funding levels of pensions uh, and it increases contributions um, from state and municipalities. And then the higher costs bolster the case of anti-pension advocates for cutting benefits. And so, I mean, this is something that I think is so important uh, because a lot of times when you're in union circles, there'll, there'll be some resistance to talking about the way the pension fund is invested. And Jay is, you know, has been, uh, and Lisa, who I know signed up for this, but I'm not sure is on, you know, have, uh, and I'm sure others of you have as well have been active in fossil fuel uh, divestment issues uh, where you, I'm sure you've encountered this, where there's a lot of discomfort in talking about the way that the pension fund has invested. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't have any other choice uh, because when the pension fund performs worse than it should, when it performs substantially worse than the market, this creates the conditions for an organized attack on our pensions. One and two, uh, crowds out means that you know more money has to go to our pension that could go to higher benefits, that could go to essential public services. So yeah, you know, I mean kind of going back to what I was talking about before, you know, I mean, yeah, Schwartzman donated $36 million to Republican groups uh, in 2022 and manages billions in for blue state pension funds. Uh, Paul Singer um, of Elliott Management uh, donated, uh, manages hundreds of millions of dollars in pension assets uh, and is one of the top donors to the Republican Governors Association. Uh, and then a story I reported on, and you know, and Barbara and I worked on this back in the day. But you know, uh, nearly all of the top charter school backers in Massachusetts uh, manage money for the state uh, pension fund. Um, so again, you know, that, I mean, that's it, exactly what we're talking about here, where the teachers' own pension money is being used to finance the privatization of public schools. Um, and this is, you know, Massachusetts was very convenient, you know, for this analysis, because, you know, the, there was this ballot initiative. So the, the, and then there was a lawsuit about disclosing 
the donors to the ballot initiative. And when that lawsuit was conclude, concluded, you found out, you know, all these major donations from uh, pension fund managers to um, that ballot initiative committee. But for donations to charter schools, those are aren't public. I mean, we we don't know. All we know is when they've bragged about donating to charter schools um, and to charter school advocacy efforts. But for the most part, that's dark money. But what we do know is that the charter school lobby is extraordinarily well-funded, seems like it has an unlimited spigot of cash at its disposal. Um, and also that, um, you know, private equity and hedge fund managers that manage, manage pension money have uh, uh, are are very vocal in their support of of charter schools. So yeah, stepping you know back, you know, I mean, again, you know, I think for the labor notes crew, we've we attract people who are very concerned, you know, about the way that public plans are invested, uh, and you know, because we're active in in ecological movements or anti-racism efforts or uh, LGBTQ efforts or anti-poverty efforts um, <clears throat> or housing efforts. Um, so yeah, you know, while your pension may be invested in fossil fuels, uh, private prisons, the military industrial complex, payday lenders, speculative real estate, in terms of kind of normies, you know, who you work with, um, you know, I think that the key thing is to understand, you know, that they're, that the, that the pension is invested in people who are out to get pension funds. <laughs> that's, that's kind of, I think, the most winning and successful argument that we have at our disposal. And once we kind of get people, and I was just talking to Jay about this the other day, but once we get people on board with the idea that we should care about the way the pension fund is invested, then these other issues uh, start to become uh, much more palatable to have discussions about. Then we can really start to get many more normies in invested in like, yeah, we shouldn't be invested in fossil fuels. We shouldn't be invested in private prisons or payday lenders. But if we, if that, in terms of the original agitational kind of component uh, to say, hey, you know, when when we're going all in in private equity and hedge funds, um, uh, you know, we're financing our enemies and we're working to undercut the basis for pensions uh, to exist at all. That I think is the key uh, component um, here. So yeah, you know, when you start to have this conversation, you know, I mean, what some of the most, and Barbara's talked to me about this, <laughs> I mean, some of the most difficult things that you'll encounter are your own public pension trustees. Uh, and I'm not calling every union public pension trustee who votes to approve a private equity investment corrupt. I am absolutely not saying that. <laughs> Uh, but I do think that there is some history here that's worth noting, which is that there's many, many instances of cases where politicians have received large campaign contributions and bribes uh, for giving business to favored private equity and hedge fund firms. And this is, it's ongoing. So, I mean, just a few weeks ago, I had an article about Ron DeSantis, about how some of his largest donors got contracts from the state pension fund. Um, and uh, uh, this is something we see with Democratic governors and Republican governors. And basically, there's just an inherent moral hazard here, which is that because the fees are so high for private equity and hedge funds, 30,000% to as much as 60,000% higher than fees uh, for uh, uh, index funds, um, there's a huge incentive uh, to just get money in the door um, for these private equity and hedge fund firms. So yeah, you know, we've seen pay to play issues, New Jersey, New Mexico, Texas, Florida, California. Um, 
in basically every state that I've looked at their pension in a systematic way, you see, uh, you've seen pay to play issues. And this, this is, these are the more extreme examples, but in terms of when you're dealing with your public pension trustees, who will say, you know, well, I've been on the pension for, you know, 15 years, you know, and I haven't seen anything untoward. I think they honestly believe that. But I, I would say that, you know, there is one example, and I can say this now because she's not on the on the board anymore, and I won't say the pension fund uh, either, but there, there's one pension fund trustee that I, I worked with for many years that, you know, that um, because I was helping to train them uh, on kind of the basics in here, and and we would we would meet up at, at different pension fund events and you know talk and and we were friends. Um, and after I had known her for two years uh, and interacted with her many 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 times, we were just talking and you know she she was like, and it came out that she has dinner with George Roberts, the billionaire co-founder of KKR, four times a year. And that the next time she was going to have dinner with them, uh, she was going to ask George to invest in her own business. That's plainly illegal. Uh, this is somebody who comes out of a great progressive militant local, was trained by me for years, including on ethics, uh, <laughs> was... Uh, <laughs> You know, I mean, this is somebody who I'd worked with for a long time, and I have to believe she knew that that was not right. Uh, but unfortunately, basically, when you have people who are put in charge of these large pots of capital, billions and billions of dollars, and aren't trained uh, from the beginning, it leads to this kind of moral hazard. And so, and at these pension fund meetings and retreats, you know, there's a lot of alcohol. Um, there's all these people in suits running around, you know, saying, you know, that these, you know, giving you all this attention and who went to these very fancy universities uh, uh, and have all this money at their disposal. And that's the way that these public pension trustees are trained. And that's, and that's just on the Wall Street side. Then there's the staff as well. Um, <laughs> The staff of these pension funds, there's a huge revolving door, um, and they they intimidate our trustees. That is, in every pension I've worked with, that is what happens. Uh, they also make a lot of money. I mean, not any as much, where near as much as Wall Street folks, but, you know, three, four, five, six hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, these pension fund CEOs, uh, they also have degrees from fancy universities, uh, and they will threaten our trustees once they start to speak up or ask questions. They'll say, you're violating your fiduciary oblig obligations by questioning the staff um, and, and saying, you can put yourself at risk. And they'll have their attorneys write letters to our pension fund trustees saying, you know, by asking basic questions, you are waiving your uh, indemnification by the pension fund. And we will not defend you. Uh, <laughs> and if you have any issues with that, well, you can hire your own lawyer and you can sue us to, to try and get your indemnification back uh, as a pension fund trustee. So that's kind of, you know, there's a very real carrot and stick approach. So when, as you are active, as you start to kind of raise these concerns or questions in your union, typically the first person your union leaders will refer you to are the trustees. And almost universally, the trustees have been dealing with this carrot and stick approach for many years. And they have been trained to defer to the staff. Uh, and they have been trained that it's okay to, uh, you know, accept, you know, martinis from Wall Street executives. Typically, that's legal. It's legal to accept typically gifts of less than $50 or $25 from uh, people who have business before you. Um, and unfortunately, those, you know, $17 cocktails go a long way. You know, most teachers don't have enough money to drop $18 on a cocktail. Most bus drivers definitely don't have enough money to drop $18 on a cocktail. 
And just that alone can start to engender uh, a type of view, especially if it's combined with this stick approach. Um, and I've seen it time and time again. So I'm not sure when you, I know you're gonna start moving into fighting back, so maybe you address this, but just to note in the chat that uh, Linda, Lindy's asking like, are there ways that we've addressed this very issue about the intimidation of the trustees? Has there been any sort of successful ways I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is, is demystifying, <laughs> you know, is, I mean, once, once the way that trustees stop feeling like both isolated on the one hand and kind of smarter than their colleagues on the other is by rank and file members speaking up. So in this way, it's, I mean, it's the exact same thing that we see when we're pushing for open marketing, right? You know, it's like, you know, the chief negotiator, you know, in most locals across the country has been trained over decades by both HR and frankly, by their own union leadership. And then sometimes by the rank, of, not just sometimes, often by the rank and file members themselves, you know, that they are the ones that by sitting in the room with the boss, and sharing, you know, a couple of beers, they can get the best deal uh, for the members. And only by the members saying, hey, we want <laughs> to know what's going on here. We want open bargaining. Uh, does that change the perspective in any way? Even with, you know, chief negotiators who are, I mean, I've met chief negotiators who are self-identify as anarcho-syndicalists or are members of the Communist Party or, you know, other very far left, you know, organizations, DSA members, you know, uh, who, you know, believe, even if they will say, well, you know, open bargaining makes sense in some circumstances, will frequently, you know, think that the best, you know, and say it explicitly that the best way to kind of resolve issues with management is one-on-one -on -one between a paid union staff person and, uh, and management and the HR director. Uh, and I've seen people who, you know, and this is the, one of the great things about being a union staffer or not great things is you see people who are Bernie Sanders supporters through and through <laughs> um, and who say they believe in the organizing model um, who, um, uh, you know, at the end of the day are, you know, believe in, in business unionism. Uh, so I think it's the same thing here is, once once we kind of see pensions as part and parcel of everything else that we we are as a union uh and that includes not just the benefits but the way the union the the money is invested because we recognize that if the money is invested poorly that's going to impact our benefits and that's going to be impact uh the way uh that we're able to fund essential social services or not um, that's when trustees start to start behaving better, better. They start to speak up, uh, and they start to at least ask more questions. I mean, look, you know, again, this is labor notes. I mean, a bunch of the times, you know, you frankly have to defeat people, you know, <laughs> I mean, like that's, you know, uh, <laughs> there is both, you know, there's a carrot and stick approach on our, some trustees I think are absolutely movable, but in a lot of cases, maybe, you know, I mean, maybe the overwhelming majority of cases, you know, you need fresh blood, you know, you need kind of people who are going to kind of enter in and just be like, I don't understand any of what you're saying here, but I know that I was elected <laughs> to manage my own goddamn money. And so like, I'm going to be able to I'm going to ask whatever questions I damn well please, and I'm going to vote however I want, you know. Uh, and so, yeah, like that's it. So much of it is basically is tied, I think, to this labor notes vision of unionism, more or less, which is that the workers have the answers, you know. Uh, and even if the workers don't have the answers right then and there, they can, in the world of the World Wide Web, <laughs> they can access information that allows them to make an informed decision uh, independently of union staff, independently of experts, independently of, um, of management. Um, so yeah, you know, I mean, I think, you know, go ahead. Barbara. 
Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to like give an example from the Mass Teachers Association, uh, specifically to Lindy's question, where for uh, we've had sort of the same members representing being elected on our, our prim board for years now. And at our annual meeting, our representative assemblies, every year uh, they would get on and be the experts protecting uh, the interests, not often of the members is what it felt like, but of their knowledge and their relationships. But over the last six or seven years at each of those annual meetings, there would be some effort on the part of the membership to begin to raise questions, to move motions that would require that they raise questions. A lot of that was around fossil fuel uh, divestment and up to like, and over the course of time, you could see the members in the room be more confident in their own knowledge about the questions that were being asked and vote more and more against the recommendations of the representatives until this last time, one of our members who I think had spent some time talking to you, Matthew, about yeah. private equity, moved a number of motions requiring them to take on private equity investig investigations about private equity investments in our pensions. And the members overwhelmingly voted to support those motions in spite of every effort by the trustees to say otherwise. And so it was slow, but the members were more confident in terms of understanding that they were the ones who should be making the call and they're pushing the trustees that way. So just a small example. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, we've seen that elsewhere. So yeah, you know, I mean, when my boss, David Sirota, and then later me, we we did a bunch of reporting uh, during Chris Christie's second term about um, his mismanagement of the pension. And workers got a hold of that and they went gangbusters. And so, and then, you know, then one of the, you know, the CWA local presidents who before this had been very reticent to was on the pension fund board. And before this, before we started reporting this had been very reticent to raise questions, even though the governor was, you know, kicking the CWA's ass left and right. Uh, you know, then he was like, he started getting emails left and right from the members. And he was like, well, you know, clearly I have to start raising questions here. And so then that happened that, you know, then New Jersey then cut their uh, allocation to hedge funds substantially. Um, uh, and yeah, similarly, you know, I mean, uh, you saw, uh, I mean, the, this was, I mean, this actually did come out of, you know, uh, there was a union staff component here that came out of here where, you know, I mean, Randy Weingarten got, um, you know, uh, I mean, she was, uh, in New York, they were dealing with these massive, you know, charter school attacks, you know, every year. Uh, and so then uh, Michael Kink, who's a friend of hers that does organizing in New York and is kind of like her left hand in New York politics, you know, um, started following the money and was like, all this, you know, charter money is coming from, pen is coming from uh, uh, private equity and hedge funds. Um, and so then they launched this campaign called Hedge Clippers, uh, that really went after hedge funds for a few years and and got kind of a bunch of pension funds to divest uh, from hedge funds um, at the time as well. So that was that was kind of a, you know that was more grass topsy I think than kind of what we're um, talking about here. But it does show that kind of once once a labor leader or a labor member kind of gets it in their head that it's you know this is important you know uh, you know that you know there's um, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars of workers' capital that's being used to attack workers. That seems crazy. Um, then you can you can create change um, uh, in a pretty systematic way quickly. In Vermont, which was a campaign, it was a fun campaign a couple of years ago that I was um, very involved in, which was, I mean, it was so funny. I had just moved home and I had... Uh, my uh, my brother had, uh, who was a black man, had uh, passed away from an opioid overdose, and I was very uh, happy to be home in Vermont uh, because you know I was taking care of my family, but also very angry about the state <laughs> and you know the way in which kind of public policy had contributed to contributed to my brother's death. Um, 
So right as I got home, um, the state legislature launched this massive coordinated attack on on defined benefit pensions. Uh, it was astounding uh, to see from, it was the only time I've actually seen it uh, from a democratic state legislature where the pension fund was actually pretty well funded. I mean, in Illinois, you'll see, you know, uh, uh, Democrats routinely attack pensions, but that's in part because they skimped on the contributions uh, for decades and then the plans were terribly invested. And so you have uh, very low funding levels. And, but in Vermont, it was the first time. Uh, and so, uh, and you had the House Speaker, you had the Republican governor, you had the Senate president pro tem, you had the state treasurer all saying, okay, you know, there's a crisis, came out of nowhere, you need to cut benefits immediately. Uh, and so, yeah, I just talked with a few different workers and kind of did some research um, and showed that, you know, that any of the money that could be gained from cutting benefits uh, is, you know, you could more than gain that back by investing the pension in a plain vanilla index fund uh, and workers ran with it big time. Uh, and it was it was not, I mean, it, it did not meet labor notes best practices. I was a basket case. You know, I was just talking to tons of people on the phone was basically it. We weren't, we didn't have, we didn't have an organizing plan, weren't doing assessments. You know, the state legislative session was going to end in two months and we had to stop the bill. Uh, and so it was just a bunch of crazy people running around basically. <laughs> um, but it's a small state, you know, as you know, it's one tenth the size of Massachusetts. And so word gets far and there's 150 state reps. And so the districts are only 4,000 people. And so, Basically, the article went super viral and, you know, everybody was calling me and emailing me and I was like, email your state legislators and just tell them to read the article and respond. And uh, and then the union leadership that initially, you know, uh, I mean, that that's not totally true. The Interestingly enough, the more... <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell so a little, a little gossip here, but the, the State Employees Association, which was an independent, was facing a substantial desert effort of its uh, correctional workers because they had made some vague pro-Black Lives Matter statements. And so the State Employees Association, which typically was not aggressive uh, with the legislature, knew that they had to be very aggressive with uh, defending the pension or else the correctional workers were going to leave immediately. Um, and so so they took my article, very typically pretty conservative union, and they ran with it big time. And then that dragged along the, the teachers union as well, which also typically has a pretty, you know, get along to go along relationship uh, with the state legislature. So then the teachers union um, uh, took it too. And then we stopped it. And it was at the beginning, we had, you know, uh, I mean, dozens of state legislators who had endorsed Bernie both times who were saying the only way to save the pension is to cut it. Uh, every, every state legislator, again, it's a small state, so I knew many of these people, uh, you know, every state legislator I talked to, people I had known for decades, you know, were like telling me on the phone, Matthew, I understand, you know, very condescending. I understand, Matthew, that you've been, you know, looking at pensions for a long time, but I've I've done my own research. And the only way we could protect this pension is if we cut benefits. Two weeks later, they were like, no, 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 no cuts at all. We'll have a commission, we'll include labor, we'll, you know, and so uh I think that underscores basically how effective once you include kind of this analysis of, okay, how is Wall Street extracting revenue from the pensions? Uh, can you use that to effectively defend your interests in negotiations uh, or, you know, at the legislature? Uh, there's another example too. I mean, um, some SEIU locals in Los Angeles, um, in 2013, they were just in bargaining, interestingly enough, uh, and they didn't even really talk about the pension, but they did include the enormous fees paid to Wall Street by the pension fund in their analysis. And so they they ran the numbers and they were like, you know, in 2012, 
Los Angeles spent more money on fees to Wall Street than on repairing city streets. Uh, and that really altered the whole dynamic in the city. So instead, you know, this was at the peak of anti-public sector union hysteria. Uh, and they really flipped the narrative where it's like, no, like us trying to get a 3% raise is not the issue here. You know, instead it's the enormous fees being paid out to Wall Street. Uh, and they were able to get, you know, for the standards of that time, you know, we're in a much better bargaining environment now. But for the very standards of that time when, you know, 3% was, you know, about the best you could get and overwhelmingly unions were negotiating 1%, 2% uh, increases. Uh, and yeah, they got a great contract. Uh, and so I think that, again, underscores when, when you kind of do this type of analysis, you can um, get great results. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, so Lindy is asking me in the chat, chat about like, how do you how do you get that information? Like when you say do that kind of analysis, how do we do that? Where do we start to find the numbers? Yeah, well, I can send, a, I'll send out some resources after this. Um, I should have collected them beforehand, <laughs> but I apologize. But yeah, you know, there is, there is a report um, that comes out. It might be a couple of years old at this point, but um, uh, there was a report that actually done by a conservative think tank on the Maryland Public Policy Institute um, that tracked pension fund fees. Uh, that's a great thing. But um, you know what? I am going to, I will send an example uh, of how you find it. But basically, you can go to the annual financial report of the pension fund for the fees. You can go to the annual financial report for the pension fund. And typically, if you just search expense in that in that uh, annual financial report, you will get to um, you know what's called the net expense, uh, and that's the total fees paid to Wall Street in a given year. So yeah, but it's frankly it's a great idea for a follow up workshop. <laughs> um, so I guess I'm I'm trying to get your twelve dollars now <laughs> for labor notes, which is um, yeah you know we. It could make sense, probably does make sense to do a follow-up workshop where I can show you exactly how you can kind of gather this information yourself. Uh, it can be sometimes a little bit hard to parse, um, but yeah, you know, I mean, certainly, um, yeah, but that's the other thing. I mean, Lindy, I don't, I don't know which, Lindy, which union are you with? You can un unmute yourself. Hi, Matthew. I'm with Education Minnesota. Okay. Well, you know, you can, I mean, let's chat um, uh, because, yeah, I can, yeah, there's, I mean, part of it, yeah, definitely, I, I think, I think a workshop, you know, uh, makes sense, but, you know, it's also, um, you know, I, I can help and, I, and I'm happy, happy to help. And then that can, once kind of, it, do you have a researcher at Education Minnesota? Yeah, we do. Okay. Yeah. Because then that, you know, typically, yeah, if you just kind of train the researcher and then kind of give the rank and filers, you know, a broad understanding, then folks can can run with it. But that's a great question. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, going back to what I was saying uh, kind of before, you know, um, it's about shifting the narrative. So, you know, if we operate on the on the terrain, you know, of like, you know, it's our benefits, we earned it. Yeah, I mean, that that can be very effective for internal organizing. Whether or not that's the best message public facing, I think is, I, I would say it's not, you know, I mean, again, you know, that the problem really is, is Wall Street predation. Uh, and, uh, and that's, um, and so, uh, yeah, when, and, and that's just what the SEIU locals did in Los Angeles, right? You know, it was once they shifted the terrain. It's like, instead of it being about our 3%, it's about, um, the enormous fees paid to Wall Street, they were able to fundamentally upend management's position in negotiations. Um, so yeah, it's the same here, you know. Um, and then in terms of an internal kind of effort, you know, I, I think it's, you know, a lot of members don't know um, that 
their pensions are at risk. One, uh, I think there's also uh, a lack of understanding that pension benefits could be better, even substantially better. I mean, you know, the the there actually hasn't been too much organized research on this, but I just know from my two grandmothers, my, my grandmother had a same-sex spouse, um, and my my biological grandmother was um, uh, a teacher in the DC uh, public school system, and her spouse was a teacher in the Maryland public school system. And the difference between their two pensions was extreme, you know, where my grandmother got you know, sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year uh, in pensions, and her spouse got twenty five grand a year uh, in 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 their pension. So, you know, I, I I do think you know for the purposes here, you know, we sh- as part of this whole conversation, and I said this to Jay when we we Jay O'Neill when we talked uh, the other day, is that part of how we have a you know for those of us you know like myself you know who are really concerned about you know, not just these attacks on pensions, but the the horrific social effects of these pension fund investments, financing the fossil fuel sector that is seeking to, to destroy livable life on this planet. Um, in my view, part of that conversation of how we get, you know, normies on board with fossil fuel divestment is by having a real conversation about expanded pension benefits. Um, that, you know, for the most part, they aren't as generous as they should be. You know, teachers should be able to, you know, retire after, you know, 35 years making the same amount that they did their last year of teaching. That is a real kind of goal that we should have as the labor movement. And even more so with public employees who make substantially less than teachers, you know, bus drivers, you know, um, uh, 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 paraprofessionals. Um, uh, and so uh, uh, I, I think that that's a, a you know janitors you know that's a that's a big component as well as is, is how can we start talking about um, as a labor movement and as individual unions more robust benefits period and you know I mean the great thing is I mean at this point in time is we're really set up to start having that conversation I think um, you know. Uh, more than ever before, attrition and turnover and vacant positions are a problem uh, in the public sector. Um, uh, more than ever before, I think uh, we're not seeing attacks on on pension benefits. And so now is the time, I think, for us to start having a real conversation um, about expanded benefits as a component of um, uh of our broader agenda for uh, for dignity on the job uh, in the public sector. Um, oh, okay, sorry. Um, well, the, here's some, I'll share the, I wanna have a little bit of conversation. I did not realize what time it was, so I apologize. We, uh, if, if people can say, we can we can go over a little bit. Okay. So yeah, um, go ahead. Um, so um, yeah, you know, I, I mean, these are just some kind of sample talking points, you know, which is like, you know, how can we afford public sector pensions, you know, instead of being like, these are our benefits, we earned it, which is very accurate. Uh, of course, that's true. It's, you know, we get to be on a more expansive bargaining for the common good type ground when we say, well, the real question is, how can we afford these massive payouts to the wealthy on Wall Street? Why is Governor X? continuing these massive giveaways with such little oversight. Um, And then, you know, doesn't everybody have to tighten their belt? You know, instead of being like, you know, fuck that, public services are going to collapse. That's totally true. You know, say, you know, it's like, okay, yes, you're wrong and redirect. Public sector workers have already tightened their belts way too far. The question is why the pension fund uh, is sending out hundreds of millions of dollars to Wall Street. You know, I, I think beyond the scope of what's possible, you know, in terms of expanded benefits, you know, there's also, you know, the way that pension funds have been used in the past, you know. So this picture here is a perfect example, you know, Co-op City, 
in New York, this massive uh, uh, public housing development was built that people live in today. Uh, you know, was built in part with union pension fund money. Um, uh, that was more Taft Hartley plans, um, but you know, nonetheless, union pension funds have financed affordable housing. They continue to finance affordable housing today through the AFL-CIO's Housing Investment Trust. Um, but there's no reason why pension funds can't be used to finance the world that we want to build. Um, they can buy the municipal bonds of school districts that are building new schools. Um, they can uh, uh, finance uh, mass transit. They can finance anything productive that we know is going to have a long-term rate of return, uh, pension funds can help finance that. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, very few unions are talking about this uh, these days, And it, but it's, um, it's possible, just like anything we push for is possible. Uh, there's a long history it's very little history, recent history of pension funds being used uh, for these socially positive gains. But uh, there is a long history, uh, decades and decades of pension funds being used to finance um, expansive public works projects that benefit the common good. Um, it begins, in my view, with, with wider rank and file involvement in pension issues. That's the only way we can get back to this point. Um, so... Pensions to the workers. So this is this is the uh, the first volley in my view is this meeting. Maybe we can turn it into something historic, you know, where um, we we it, in my view, it, you, you know, this is exactly the type of place where it starts. We're just kind of getting folks interested, getting folks excited about wait, there's you know you know trillions of dollars here that we could that right now is be going to Wall Street that we could use to socially productive ends. Um, that, that is, uh, that's the way we can kind of potentially do something much more expansive that meets the demands of the moment that we all, um, know we need. So with that, you know, I'd love it if we could have a little discussion. I, again, there's no, I would love to hear from folks who haven't, uh, talked yet, um, about kind of any of this, any comments or questions, no question is too anodyne, uh, for this. If there was a minor technical point, I want to hear it. If there's a, a broad, expansive comment you want to make, uh, I want to hear that too. Okay. Hi, this is Kathy Cunningham Yee, CTU Local One. And I'm interested in doing the research to find out, again, where our fees are going, because it seems like we have a tier two um, uh, pension system in Chicago, public uh, the Chicago Teachers Pension Fund. And so I want to make sure that I have the right vocabulary mm -hmm. in order to start the conversation with the trustees when I attend the meetings and ask the hard questions. Where would I? I know you said there was this should be another workshop, but where could I start right now? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the Chicago Teachers Pension Fund's uh, annual financial report, um, you know, I mean, I do think it's a good, it's a good, uh, I mean, there's two things that I would suggest, and without talking, you know, just Googling kind of me or my boss plus pensions, I've written about this, so my boss is David Sirota, uh, and both of us who who wrote Don't Look Up, this um, climate change hit on Netflix, Um uh, so both of us have written extensively kind of on this issue. So if you just Google our name on pensions, and then I think it is worth, you know, it's fine to, I mean, I, I, I was a philosophy major, so I had no training in numbers whatsoever. You know, I, I just printed out the annual financial report and read it and was like, why <laughs> is this happening? <laughs> So yeah, I mean, I have written about the Chicago Teachers Pension Fund specifically. You can kind of um, uh, look at, at that there, you know, um, but yeah. <laughs> There's a question in the chat uh, from Lindy. I don't know if you want to uh, come off mute and ask that question out loud. 
Hi, sure. Thanks, Matthew. Um, so Minnesota has a two-tiered system uh, and the rule of 90 expired. So the teachers who could have retired like this year have to wait until 66 to retire now. Um, I'm wondering if that happened anywhere else and we're in a place where we're like fighting for more pension flexibility where, where um, while a lot of other sectors have lost their pension. So mm -hmm. legislators, it feels like hard to get through to them that the cost map, like the cost is worth it sometimes um, because it's, it's something that should have been a fight for decades to get the rule of 90 extended. And now we're like scrambling, you know. Um, well, I'm not sure exactly what, what do you mean by pension flexibility? So um, a lot of pension plans have uh, if you work 35 years, you can retire. This is just like you have to work till 66 or take really harsh penalties. So like any kind of rule, any kind of flexibility added, um, they're saying that like if we want to like lower it to 62, we have to play or pay a ton of employee side contributions um, where Minnesota's is already really high. Um, so yeah, I'm just wondering if you could comment on Minnesota's specific situation with teachers, because it feels, it feels unique, but I'm not sure if it is unique. My understanding is, is, is that level of, um, harshness, uh, is not particularly common. That, that's my understanding in terms of the benefit structure. I mean, I would suggest, you know, in terms of a resource, you know, um, uh, so Jim Kane at NEA National is. Ha, have you have you ever talked with Jim? Um, so yeah, he is an amazing resource. I mean, he's really, really, really bright. Um, and so, and they have done research uh, about the benefit plan structures across the country. You know, I mean, one thing that I would look for is in the plan that I I I, I just don't know because I haven't looked at Minnesota's plan specifically is is this question of you know has there been a reduction in the discount rate kind of recently um one uh two you know is how are costs being framed you know i mean is it you know typically you know it's the state legislature will say oh well you know this I, what i said you know there's this huge amount of money that we have to, you know, contend with. And so, you know, either it's going to come from here or there, you know, whereas um, uh, a discussion about Wall Street's role is pushed to the side. So, I mean, one of the interesting thing that, um, that many teachers unions have done, uh, Kentucky was one place, um, I, I believe it was done in California as well, if I recall, um, I don't have the, but, um, you know, the full universe of pension fund fees is typically not disclosed. I mean, that's one of the big problems with private equity and hedge funds is that he, even the official number that we have for fees is likely a tip of the iceberg. Um, and so uh, that is a fun way to deal with these annoying, you know, state senate finance committee chairs or, you know, appropriations if it, that's the, I don't know what it's like in Minnesota. Sometimes it depends. Um, uh, is like, okay, well, you're saying we have to do this. Well, let's, you know, we'll kick this can down the road till next session. This session, you like mandate the total universe of fees um, <laughs> that's going to be disclosed. And then if they're like, well, we're not going to do that, then you're like, well, okay, then then there's no point in us like having a friendly negotiation here. You know, we're we're going to pressure you. You know, that's a great way for kind of making a clear dividing line is like, you're saying our pension costs are the problem. <laughs> yeah, you won't even mandate full fee disclosure. Okay, well, this is where this we're done here. So that's that's a fun thing that some teachers uh, not not it's mainly came out of AFT. AFT has some. So is Education Minnesota a dual affiliate or is it just, okay, yeah. So uh, yeah, there's some really great national staff at AFT. Elizabeth Parisian is one of them. Um, uh, 
and so who have been involved in this fee disclosure uh, kind of push. So yeah, Jim at NEA is really great for that comparative research and some of the more technical stuff. And Elizabeth is really great for kind of the politics communications kind of organizing aspect of it. Um, so before we get to show uh, who has her hand up, JD had a comment slash question in the chat. Uh, wondering about if there are any examples of unions that have started their own uh, Taft-Hartley funds uh, recently, if they've been able, so sort of wondering about that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, we should do, I mean, if there's interest, I mean, we have to figure it out. If there's interest for a private pension workshop, I'd love to do it. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a whole different universe, frankly. It's, you know, it's it's very different in so many ways than public pensions. There are some overarching similarities, but like, for example, I would never say in a private pension workshop that funding levels are not important. It's very important in private pensions. Um, uh, but um, uh, Yes, unions have, it's one of the great secrets. Unions have been starting new Taft-Hartley pension funds. There are several new Taft-Hartley plans started every year. Um, so this idea that private pensions are dead, you know, is totally wrong. Private single employer pensions, yes. I mean, are, I mean the idea of an employer, getting an employer to start a new private single employer pension is almost certainly off the table at this point. But I think that uh, multi-employer plans are poised to make a major comeback. Um, the big issue is just fighting for it. You know, I mean, you have to, It's it goes back to everything that we talk about at Labor Notes is, you know, to start a new multi-employer plan, you need to line up, you know, contracts across different employers. You need to have, you know, cross local, you know, or cross unit collaboration. You need to, kind of have like escalating actions, you need to have, <laughs> um, uh, you need to run a coordinated, you know, comprehensive campaign, you need to do all these things that we talk about at Labor Notes, but is, you know, hard enough to do in, a, in your own single shop, but coordinated, you know, across multiple shops. But yes, I, I mean, we should talk more, you know, I think it's, I, I was, it's not known at all that union, I've talked to some very, you know, um, some of the most intelligent people I know in the labor movement. Yeah, I mean, actually, I mean, Barbara, when I told Mike Fadel this, who's the new executive director of Massachusetts Teachers, he was like, his jaw dropped. He was like, we start four new multi-employer plans every year? <laughs> I had no idea. I was like, neither did I until I talked to the main lawyer for multi-employer plans. He was like, I start them all the time. So. Um, yeah, I, I do think it's um, it's doable, but it it requires a lot of lead up um, work um, uh, to start them. And um, yeah, so Sheila, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, hi, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I want to go back to something you said much earlier, um, and um, I, I was a little confused by it. You said that. Uh, when these um, uh, pension funds, you know, sell off some of the private equity um, and uh, hedge fund, you know, investments, they have no, they, you know, they buy it for, they bought it for ten dollars, but they sold it for ten, for four. How come they don't know all during the course of holding these investments how much the um, how much the uh, selling price is worth if if they you know only find they can only find out when they sell it. Yeah, it's like a house. Yeah, basically. Yeah, you know. So I mean, you you don't know really know the you know your assessed value, but you don't know the resale value of your house until you sell it. But then, but typically, at least with your house, you have the assessed value. You have what other houses on your street are selling for. Here, there's so much more black box secrecy where frequently pension funds won't disclose what they sold. Uh, these assets for. They'll sell them in one big tranche. So you'll only know, you know, the total write down, but you won't know the write downs of individual investments. So there's no, I mean, frankly, you know, I mean, there's right, there's hundreds of thousands of realtors and people in the real estate industry whose job it is to figure out the valuation of houses, which are, is hard enough to do with all those people. But 
here you have, you know, maybe three or four academics, you know, in the country actually trying to figure out the value uh, of these of these hundreds of billions of dollars in investment. Um, so does that answer your question or do you have a follow-up question? Um, no. <laughs> because, <laughs> well, what, so, you know, I mean, maybe this sounds uh, very simplistic. Why don't they try? Why, I mean, you know, if you want to find out how some, some things, how much something's worth, why, why, why don't you try to sell it to see how much it's worth? I mean, there's absolutely no way that they can they can approximate this. Um, it, it just sounds, um, you know, even if you want to sell your house, you could put it on the market, you know, for a minute and, um, you know, see if anybody bites. But um, that's what I'm wondering. But you can yeah. tell me. <laughs> it, I mean, it's, I, I mean, again, I mean, this is the way I toned it down a little bit, you know, and other works. On it. But I mean, in my view, it's systematic organized fraud. I mean, there's nothing it's there's there's no other way to put it and unfortunately you know the pension fund staff and most of the trustees are you know or not most of them i mean many of the trustees are you know um complicit uh in it it, it should not be allowed in my view public mm -hmm. pension funds shouldn't be allowed to invest in private equity and hedge funds um and um it's, okay yeah, it's a tragedy. That's, that's more satisfying when I hear that they're, <laughs> they're, they're fraudulent criminals. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> certainly explains it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Veronica, you had a question uh, that you put in the chat. We're going to hear from Veronica and Erica, and we'll see where things are for ready to wrap up or if we have more questions. Veronica. Uh, um, hi. Yeah. Yes. Huh. Hi, yeah, so um, I don't know if this is something you've looked into, but you know, in Texas, there were a couple of bills that passed that prevent state funds from being divested from certain industries, like specifically fossil fuels and guns and ammunition. Um, and do you think that that's something that could expand to include other industries? Is that something like nationally we should be on the lookout for? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, it is um, the fossil fuel. I mean, it's an interesting setup, you know, I mean, the um, uh, like so much of it, in my view, is is just these extreme right wing state legislators wanting to settle points. That's one, you know, uh, settle scores. That's one component of it. Another of it, a component of this is distracting people from kind of the enormous amounts of Wall Street predation occurring that's, you know, far more relevant. Um, and uh, uh, and it's probably some mix of the two of those things. I think it's it's definitely a concerning development. You know, I what I do go back to, and I, I said this to Jay, you know, who's very involved in in these efforts is, you know, it's unfortunately, in my experience, I could be wrong, it's it's hard to get, you know, normie rank and file union members to care about something like an uh a a bill that prevents the pension fund from divesting from fossil fuels. Um, but if it's if there's a broader education project done about pensions and how, you know, how your you know, shitty benefits play into, you know, all kinds of bad things in society that we want to prevent and how we have, you know, an organized approach for reducing, uh, uh, for both protecting our plans and also ensuring that our plans are invested in socially responsible ways. Uh, and there's a broader agitational organi organizing conversation that occurs in the broader context of a revival of the union at the work site through expanded steward structures, ongoing training, escalating actions, structure tests, um, all of the above, then you can, then that's how you do get people to care about it. But unfortunately, kind of going directly from, you know, you know, just trying to kind of get people to sign up for, for the union period, which is, you know, in Texas is the main kind of goal is, you know, there's, uh, I don't know the exact density, you know, um, 
than it is for teachers unions in Texas, but it's, you know, it's, it's, there's no collective bargaining and there's, you know, um, uh, uh, no closed shop either. Um, uh, there's, there's definitely some steps that it takes to, to get people, you know, to make it so this is an issue that is actually agitational to people. It should be, in my view, immediately agitational to people, but this stuff is mystified, I think, for a very specific reason, you know, I mean, there's, you know, the, I think it's the way that finance is taught and not taught uh, in America has something very clearly uh, to do with um, the total Wall Street control over our democracy. And there's a great quote I came across uh, recently, which was like, every successful fortune begins with a secret. <laughs> uh, and I, I think that that really applies here. Uh. Erica. Erica, I think you're, you're muted, Erica. Sorry about that. I listened to you earlier, Matt. You said you had done some studying and writing on uh, the Chicago Teachers Pension Fund. And uh, um, I'm, I'm one learning of it at the moment, uh, but I have been doing a little bit of studying in the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I learned just by looking at the documents that our CTPF website provides is that we have, in 2021, we had 66 private equity firms that we had like on our payroll. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. 66, like that's mm -hmm. a lot of hands in our pot, right? Mm -hmm. And I was also, I also put it some time in to look at the expense, at the expense ratios, at the fees. And obviously I didn't get far. That is very cumbersome. Mm -hmm. It's very tedious to look over documents that CTPF provides, or I'm sure any any pension uh, group probably, um, I'm sure in, in, intentionally, uh, so that we just kind of give up. But I, I was able to learn that we had 66 private equity firms with their hands in our pot. We were paying exp uh, fees to them. And I reached out to, to staff and them, uh, you know, with my findings and with my questioning, like that's a lot of private equity, that's a lot of firms, you know, do we need any, I also learned that um, in Texas, they did, a, they did a study, or not a study, the study that I wanted to bring up in a minute was in Pennsylvania. But Texas itself made, um, there was a couple articles that came out in some of the Texas newspapers. And one of them uh, was about comparison they made between public pensions and their investments in private equity firms, compared that to some of the public pensions there who, whose main investments were institutional index funds. Yeah. And they found that over time, only 3% of private equity firms actually made yeah. above the actual index funds. Yeah. You know, yeah. however, 3%. Yeah. yeah. And so we're studying this. We're, you know, <clears throat> trying to find a way to, like Kathy said earlier, trying to find a way to talk to our pension trustees or our staff, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and of course, I'm I'm in a position where I want to learn too how to stand my ground because I throw these facts at them, like all these private equity firms, these high fees, underperformance over time. You know, I throw that and that's pretty much all I got. And then they come back with some jargon, right? Some long-winded jargon explanation about how it's going well with these firms. And I understand that some of them do outperform it, you know, but in the long run, it's a, yeah. it's almost zero. And so I came across a study that was done in Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania um, pension system has been doing really well, mostly institutional index funds, low fees. And earlier in one of your slides, you uh, had there that I, I think New Jersey, that that was a win for New Jersey, if I'm correct. I don't remember, I think it was New Jersey on your slide. One of the wins that they were able to push out a lot of the private equity firms from their pension holdings and instead um, just kind of bring in more index, inst institutional index fund, uh, that approach with the lower fees. So my question is, I would like to like follow their lead. Like if you, I, I don't know how they did it. 
in, in my district, our union does not want to get publicly involved with the C Chicago Teachers Pension Fund, mm -hmm. right? We have representation in our, as our trustees. One of our issues is there's different caucuses in our union. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whatever is going outside the, the Teachers Pension Fund, it's transferring into the conversation, you know, of, of the trustees um, and, and uh, the decision making that's going on there. Um, very political, but um, outside of that, just as a nonpartisan uh, movement, um, how would one, you know, just maybe, maybe you could tell, or in another webinar, like how did New Jersey do it? If it wasn't New Jersey, how did they get their trustees, their fund to fire, you know, get rid of eventually little by little, maybe these private equity firms and lower their fees and instead, you know, just start investing in, in um, you know, just passive index funds and uh, with lower fees and just, you know, following the market. Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll do a plug for other labor notes. Work. I mean, I I I I do kind of see it as like an organizing kind of issue. You know, I mean, I think that when you know, I'm I'm, you know, somewhat familiar with the caucuses in CTU, and I think that um, you know, there's definitely been a lot of um, uh, animosity. It seems like I mean, particularly kind of animosity directed at core. Um, but I, 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 I'm vaguely familiar. I was in Chicago a while ago. I mean, my, my feeling is that, um, you know, what secrets of the successful organizer kind of teaches. And then there was an, my, one of my favorite labor notes article that when I was a union staffer, I sent out like every month was like, uh, how to resolve conflicts in your union, um, which is, you know, so, I mean, do you guys do a, just a conflict resolution workshop, uh, Barbara? Uh, no, we don't. Uh, worthwhile, probably. But um, yeah, you know, it's like, I mean, how can there be, you know, kind of a conversation, you know, about pension issues, you know, that, you know, traverses kind of some of these divides that have been raucous, you know, within the caucus environment. That would be my question. And so that's, it, that, you know, it's it's difficult, especially kind of when, you know, there have been, you know, uh, you know, uh, I, all I say is it's difficult, you know, but I think that the best way is like, okay, you know, first of all is like, can there be like a conversation independently of, of kind of previous conflicts, you know, that's about kind of finding a collective common ground and common solution. That, that's kind of my, my, my suggestion or my idea on that front. Yeah, I, I was going in the same direction, Matthew, sort of like <laughs> what, what, what's the, this could actually be a unifying issue in spite of the political differences. Yeah, yeah. And so like, what's well, the Matt but, but actually, maybe, my question, but, my question was more about New following Jersey New Jersey's lead. Yeah. How did New Jersey? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I will say New Jersey, that was about hedge funds and Chicago teachers did get out of hedge funds a long time ago. Um, so, um, you know, uh, in terms of private equity, it's a tougher nut to keep crack, you know, I mean, the, it's really the, the, the county pension funds in Pennsylvania have gotten out of private equity and then Nevada really kept their investments in private equity to begin with. And then in the private sector, um, plans have gotten out of private equity because there's a broader trend that's not really positive about it's pretty complex about the way the benefits are are determined that makes it so you would want to have as much in bonds uh, as possible. Um, I, the short answer is, is you know, I, I mean, I, I is kind of going back to what I just said. I mean, that's kind of why I answered that is that there isn't actually like a perfect example. There have been successes, I would say, you know, but in terms of getting a pension fund, you know, to uh, perfection, you know, I mean, my analysis is, I mean, Chicago teachers 
you know, uh, I mean, I'm against private equity generally, but, you know, is actually one of the better run pension funds uh, in the country um, because they've limited kind of the amount they've gone into uh, private equity. Um, uh, yeah. And so that's why I did answer with that kind of, well, how can, how can there be kind of a unifying discussion about how we're moving forward on this issue like independently of you know some of the internal disputes that have occurred over the years that that would be my question in which case you know i would absolutely suggest you know the secrets of a successful organizer kind of workshop series for a kind of how to bridge that um, um divide thank you um it's just about nine o'clock, so I think we should wrap up. I, I will say it, it seems like it could be very helpful to have sort of a, a follow up session that's a like, here's some specific ways to do things, including yeah. the analysis of, of uh, the fees that are being paid. Uh, how do you bring people into that conversation? Yeah. Uh, could be something that we could do. And then also sort of taking this idea of how do we start the conversations? Yeah. A lot of secrets of a successful organizer relative to pensions. What are what are some of those yeah. conversations maybe look like so that we could think about how to how to begin that work specific to this issue? Yeah. Um, uh, and then uh, yeah, that's what I was saying, uh, JD, sort of how to how to do the research as as part of that. So Matthew and I will be in touch about that. Um, Matthew, I want to thank you very much for a really, really informative workshop. Thank all of you who uh, stayed on and, and joined us. I will be sending out a link to the reporting. I'll include with that, Matthew, if you can send me your slides. Yep. Uh, and I think there's one other piece. Um, you're going to send uh, something about s some document that you had about research. That was, yeah. uh, that, yeah. that if you can send yeah. me that, I'll get yeah. that out to all of you uh, who joined us. Um, thank you very much and uh, solidarity, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you, everybody, for joining. It was really fun to have this conversation. And thank you so much for everybody who asked questions uh, in particular. I really appreciate that. So, right. go team. <laughs> go team. All right. Good Bye. night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.